In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The conference I want to give now is on the flight into Egypt. Like all scripture, there's always many, many powerful lessons. This one, we could learn so much and apply it to our own times. So, although in this contemplation the obedience of our blessed Lord is put strongly before us for our consideration, still the points selected imitate to us that the chief virtue we have to study is resignation to the will of God in the trials of this life. This mystery also reveals to us the first opposition between the working out of God's designs and the exercise of public authority in time and the country in which he was born. To prepare, let us reflect how Mary and Joseph at the bidding of the angel bear the child Jesus into Egypt, thus escaping the hands of Herod, who seeks to take him away. Number two, let us picture the long, weary road to Egypt and the cottage on the Nile where there was a settlement of Jews. Number three, let us beg what we have at heart, namely to know our blessed Lord more clearly in this mystery, that we may, we may love him more dearly and follow him more closely in his obedience and cheerful resignation under the trials and persecution of this life. If we contemplate the Holy Family in their house at Bethlehem, we shall find them modest, poor, industrious, anticipating each other in kind thoughts and charitable actions, full of love towards the blessed infant. To the world outside, he is a sign of contradiction, as parents also are. While all those who wish to live piously in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. This point is so important and has to be stressed. Those who wish to live with Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. And so one of the questions you could put to yourself right now, if you want to find out if you're living a life in Christ, are you being persecuted? Are you being mocked? Are you being ridiculed? And if you're not, it's a sign that you're really are probably falling short of living the gospel. That more maybe you're giving into what we spoke about earlier, human respect. Maybe you're putting, once again, humans, creatures above God. And that's why you're not catching any flat. Because when you're a true Catholic, People will know it. Any simple little thing is going to a restaurant, making the sign of the cross, doing your prayers. People will mock you for that. I know I have been. And so, question yourself. Examine your conscience. Are you suffering persecution? As Jesus did. You know, so many people say, you know, how can God do this to me? He did it to his own son. We see, we'll see today how he has to flee. God has to flee from man. He didn't have to, but he did. So why should we complain when these things happen? The world, being the enemy of peace, will not allow the good to enjoy it long. The world, being the enemy of peace, will not allow the good, will not allow the good to enjoy it. The world is totally against God. And that means against this church. It will not allow us to have peace. In one of the 17 encyclicals that Pope Leo XIII wrote on the rosary, he tells us that as the church goes forward towards the end, the church will grow daily in sufferings and persecutions, in trials and tribulation. That's why I don't listen to all this nonsense when you hear all about this new evangelization, this, uh, you know, the era of peace, all this stuff, uh, you know, 
we're going into darkness because the church follows the footsteps of Christ and this Christ had three phases to his life the hidden life, the active life and then the passion and therefore the mystical body of Christ must follow the life of Christ and the church went through the hidden stage in the beginning when she was growing and then the second stage in the 13th century God raised up the great saints like Francis and Dominic who would mendicants and spread the word of God throughout the whole world and many other orders and now the church has entered into the final stage of passion passion of Christ and who betrayed Christ his own who betrays Christ today his own his church more than anyone it's a shame but this is what's happening and so we're going to suffer persecution especially if we're faithful so let us learn from Mary and Joseph that true sanctity and happiness consist in perform, performing indeed the ordinary duties of our state of life but in doing them extraordinary well as we said they lived a very poor simple life I've been in the house of Nazareth in, it's in Loretto Italy now the house was lifted up by the angels and transported to first Yugoslavia at that time and then to Italy and the house is so small it was a simple house and they live very poorly but Christ the King of Kings the Lord of Lord he came into the world he didn't come in here he didn't live as a king or a prince he lived as a poor person that's why what do you think St. Francis embraced poverty for he used to cry when he would meditate that Jesus was born in the stable in the cold, weather, damp. He wasn't, there was no room for him in the inn. So we, sh we could learn so much from the Holy Family. Once again, that we must perform our ordinary duties in an extraordinary way. That's so important. So many people think there's no value in what they do. How many women are being lied to today? Tell them, no, you must go get a career. The woman doesn't belong working if she has a family. She belongs home with her children. And I never met one family yet that will do that, that sacrifices, that the husband will sacrifice, that God doesn't provide. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich. Jesus wasn't rich. That doesn't mean you're going to have servants. Did Mary have any servants? So when we turn to Jerusalem, to the place of Herod, we find all there a sink of luxury and effeminacy, cunning, deceit, cruelty, and falsehood. All the marks of the world. It just sounds like our government. It sounds like America. Herod himself inflamed with rage and a prey to the passions of worldly ambition plans the massacre of the innocent children. But in vain does he endeavor to frustrate the designs of God. For the Lord shall laugh at him, seeing that the souls of the just are in the hands of God. And the malice of men shall not touch them. Do you believe those words of Holy Scripture? Do you believe that? That the souls of the just are in the hands of God. And the malice of men shall not touch them. Are you a just man? If you are, then you don't have to worry. You're in the hands of God. Mark here the extravagant folly of man in striving against the designs of God's providence. Well assured that in all our trials and persecutions, we have but to place ourselves entirely under the protection of Him who will not permit a hair to fall from our head without his special permission and this is so important that we get this that we have to start developing deeper trust and confidence in our God that we have to know if we're living a life of grace and we're faithful to God he will always protect us 
And if he allows anything to befall us, it's because he wants to bring a greater good out of it. And once again, we're heading for a time in this country where if you don't have faith, I feel, I pity you. Because that's the only way we're going to survive what's about to come down upon us here in this country. And we have to know that no matter how much we suffer, they can't touch us unless God allows it. We have to have the attitude of Holy Job. What the good Lord gives, the good Lord takes away. Blessed be God, now and forever. That his wife was there trying to get him to curse God. Why don't you just curse God? Get it over with and die. And Job wouldn't give in. He wouldn't give in. We too cannot give in. We have to know that in the trials and tribulations that we go through, that they will come to an end. And that we're faithful to God, He will reward us. If we return to the cottage at Bethlehem, where Mary and the Divine Infant and Holy Joseph are reposing in peaceful slumber, we find God commissioning the archangel to notify His will. For behold, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in his sleep and bids him take the child and his mother and fly to Egypt. Strange that he who is come to be the liberator and redeemer of the world should fly as if incapable of saving himself and thus foregoing an opportunity of manifesting his own and his father's power and of promoting thereby his father's glory. This is truly the Son of God. By nature, He's God. He could have crushed them. He could have crushed Herod. could have sent legions of angels. He didn't have to send legions of angels. It's mind-boggling when you meditate upon this, what God did for us. And He did this to teach us. God didn't come just to be crucified and die for us. He came to teach us the ways of holiness. He came to teach us how to walk in His path. That when we meditate upon Scripture like this, it will bring us comfort that He too knows what it's like to go through trials and tribulations. He did it. And He could have like struck them dead. The Blessed Virgin, the Queen of Heaven and Earth, Queen of all the angels and the saints, all she had to do was request that her son crush them in justice. And he would never say no to his mother. But she submits to God's will because she knows God wants this. This is what we have to do. Again, he is to make his way during the darkness of the night towards Egypt into a far distant country to undertake a journey on foot of 180 miles and dwell in a land most hostile to his nation, nation, a land that worships false idols. Jesus goes. Every direction given seems to argue the unreasonableness of such a step For might they not so easily have found shelter among the countrymen in the hilly parts of Galilee? However, Joseph listens not to such thoughts as these, but awakens Mary, who, obedient to his word, at once rises, and together with the child, they start under cover of the darkness upon their way. This is so important that we see that God, when he sent the angel, he sends the angel to the head of the family, Joseph. He didn't wake up the child Jesus, who's God. He didn't wake up the Immaculate One, the holiest creature created. No, he woke up Joseph. And Joseph, being a just man, he, he obeyed God in all things and he obeyed God promptly he didn't question God he didn't say this don't make sense I got a better way what are you crazy I got to wake up my wife and the child in the middle of the night and 
flee. I'm sure Joseph at times must have been overwhelmed in the sense of a, he had a holy fear that he knew his son, his steps, it was the son of God, God himself. That his wife, the immaculate, the most perfect creature created, that has never departed from God's will, that her intellect far surpasses his, that her virtues far surpassed his. But did that prevent him from leading? Did that prevent him from being the man of the house? Did that prevent him from, you know, not fulfilling his obligations? No. Because God gives us the grace of our vocations. And each man here has the grace for his vocation. Each man has the grace to be strong in the Lord. Each man has the grace to protect his family, to guide his family. Are you cooperating with that grace? That's another question. And so reflect on this. When you're in a situation where you feel overwhelmed, when you say, this is too hot. Why is God demanding this of me? Why are things so difficult? Be obedient like Joseph. Don't question the ways of God. But know that God will provide for you. That God doesn't give you what you want, but He gives you what you need. And that's all that matters. St. Joseph, my friends, very few people have devotion to Him. It's amazing. Very few people. And the church tells us that after the Blessed Virgin, who is the holiest saint, more holy than all the saints and angels combined, the next holiest person is St. Joseph. St. Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, is still his father in heaven. And his son will never say no to him either. The great saint like Teresa of Avila, she tell you, she always put the convents on the protection of St. Joseph. He always provides for them. And the men that I do come across that have strong devotions to St. Joseph, you could see the difference in their life. Read the litany of St. Joseph. He has many titles. Terror of demons. What a title. Terror of demons. So when you're feeling attacked by the devil, call on the terror of demons, St. Joseph. St. Joseph, pure. That's why you see him with a lily for purity. You're having problems with impurity, call on St. Joseph. You're having a problem leading your family, being the man of the house. Beg St. Joseph to come and instruct you, to strengthen you, to plead before the throne of God for the graces you need, not to give in to him in respect, and to listen to the word of God. Did you ever contemplate why did jo how did Joseph know this was truly God talking to him? Because the church warns us you can don't pay attention to dreams in general, because that could, that could be the devil. As a matter of fact, I study a lot on the Ameri North Ameri on the American Indians when Saint Isaac Joe. That's why I'm named after the North American martyr. And the devil used dreams to control the, the Indians' lives many times. When the Indians would have a dream, the whole village the next day would have to live that dream out. And those things that you see people driving around in the car, demonic, they're called dream catchers. Burn that! It's evil. Evil. Very evil. So I'm warning you about dreams. So my whole point, how did St. Joseph know that this was God telling him to get up, move? Of course, like the virgin, discern the spirit. When well, it's from God, you'll know it. And St. Joseph knew it because he was used to listening to the voice of God. He was a man of deep contemplation, a man of purity. If you're not a man of purity, you'll never be able to hear the voice of God. 
If you're giving in to the flesh, you're not going to hear the voice of God. All you can hear is the voice of the world. So we want to be able to tune in to the voice of God. Beg St. Joseph to teach you how to pray. Many men don't even know what mental prayer is. James is going to put out a list of books. He told me, uh, you know, I'll give him even more books. And some of these, I'll give you some books on mental prayer. There's a website I have, I could give you too. I'm going to give it to James, he'll post it. And uh, it's on, it's like maybe a hundred books written by great saints. Free, PDFs. Unbelievable books. St. Francis de Sales, you name it. St. Alphonse, go on and on. Take advantage of these things, but you've got to learn this. Because we want to be like St. Joseph. Because God is, wants to speak to you. And my friends, I'm telling you, everybody tells me I'm crazy for years. Some people are waking up and say, you know, you're not so crazy. Look what's going on. You may have to flee with your family. And I mean it. The communists are coming. We didn't listen to Our Lady of Fatima. If Russia is not consecrated by the Pope in union with all the bishops, she will spread her errors throughout the whole world. Whole nations will be annihilated. The consecration is never done. If it was, then how come communism is spread throughout the whole world? Europe is a communist place. America is communist now. And it's going to get real bad. Of course it wasn't done. But whole nations are about to be annihilated. My friends, start listening to the voice of God because He may wake you up and tell you to flee with your children and your wife. So no murmur escape their lips. No anxiety or regret disturbs their perfect calm, their ready and cheerful resignation to God's holy will. That's mind-boggling. I wish I could be like that myself. We've got to strive for it, though. And those that really strive to be, reach union with God will always have a peace in their soul, no matter what they go through. If you pray like St. Joseph did, you'll have that peace no matter what you're going to go through. No anxieties, no regrets, no murmurs. Why me? Why, why, why? hear that all the time. Why, why, why? St. Joseph didn't say that. St. Joseph could say, come on, your son's God. Why, what do you mean I have to flee? He could have rolled over and said, Jesus, take care of those clowns. Just, <laughs> I'm too tired. I don't want to get up. Work too hard this week. Oh, you listen to God. Because God knows what's best. Let us learn then from their example to leave in the hands of our superiors those above us who are in the place of God to us the disposal of ourselves and of our affairs as they shall seem deemed fit carrying out their orders even though to human ideas they may apparently involve humiliations want of sympathy with others and actual unkindness and may in the judgment of many appear to be unreasonable and foolish. Let us be obedient to Holy Mother Church, no matter what the cost. And that we do seem foolish, those that truly embrace the church, and what the church has taught for 2,000 years. Mary and Joseph do not even inquire how long they are to stay in exile. But make up their minds to remain till they shall be told when they are to return. They didn't worry about tomorrow. And our Lord tells us in the gospel, do not worry about tomorrow. It may not come. There is enough worry in the time now. And that's what sanctity is. Holiness is now. What is God's will for me now? Not tomorrow. Now. And if his will is for you to flee, you flee. If his will is that you be humiliated, crucified as his son, as his son was, consider your honor. 
and accept it. Mary and Joseph did not even inquire once again, how long are they going to be in exile? But they made up their minds to remain till they shall be told when they are to return. They have confidence. They know God is not going to abandon them. That if God's leading you somewhere, He's going to tell you what the next move is when He's ready, when He wants to. And we have to have patience and trust. How grand a lesson for those who are tempted to grow weary of office or place and to petition for change. Some people are always looking for change. They're always looking to run, too. St. Joseph was told to take them, and he did. And he stayed until it was time to go back. But once again, there may be someone here right now who that's what they've been doing their whole life. Constantly running though. Without waiting for God to tell you to go. Without discerning, is this what God wants? Does He really want me to make this move? Our Lord's parents proceed on their journey into Egypt. Let us admire their prompt and blind obedience notwithstanding the age of the holy child, a baby, the delicacy of the mother, the inclemency of the season. Imagine riding on a donkey for 180 miles. You guys cry when you got to drive 20 miles of work back and forth. What about the Blessed Virgin on a donkey for 180 miles in a dangerous land? No food, no nothing. Nothing over their head. No shelter. The inclemency of the season. The poor provisions that they have been able to make. Their entire ignorance of the road and of the nature of the country. Or the resources whence they are to draw their support. You know... You know, Joseph didn't get on the internet, so let me see if I get a job over there in Egypt, you know. He went, obedient. Know that God provides for everything. When we do God's will, we don't have to fear nothing. When we do God's will, He pours out His graces and He gives us even more graces. Their whole reliance is placed on the providence in God who has given them the order which they are obeying. I'm telling you, this is so important. This is one of, one of my favorite meditations. And especially what's going to happen in this country. You're going to need this faith and trust that St. Joseph had. Because it's going to feel like everything's over. People are going to start despairing in this country. Especially all the fools that say, vote for the rest of the two evils. It drives me nuts. And they cry. These are the same people that are always crying. Well, our leaders are all evil. Well, you've been voting for that for 40 years. You choose evil every time. When you choose evil, it's sinful. Simple as that. And you wonder why you have evil. The lesson of two evils now, 40 years as we go along, is so evil it spins your mind. We're not supposed to have anything to do with evil. Never choose evil. You can't vote for someone who kills babies in the mother's womb, who says it's a right to kill a baby for abortion. So all of a sudden you're playing God now, that it's a right to select that baby to be put to death, not the other one. What a joke. We're so blind. We don't trust God. We don't trust God. So their whole reliance is placed on the providence of God who has given them the order which they are obeying. Let us accompany them in spirit as they pass through Hebron and the hilly parts of Judea and Bathsheba and onwards towards Gaza and then through the land of Goshen and the banks of the Nile. Often they hunger and thirst during the day and at night have no roof but the vault of heaven to shelter them always wearied and worn with their long traveling, yet preserving the same cheerfulness and resignation, the same unwavering confidence in God, 
the same recollection and union with Him in prayer and in their adoration and love towards the Divine Infant. They were totally at peace. They could never be happier because they knew they were doing God's will. And that's beautiful. Didn't matter. The whole world could fall apart. I'm doing what God wants. That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. He, at the same time, offers himself to all this suffering. Jesus, I'm talking about. And joyfully accepts it for our sake. While he imparts interior grace to Mary and Joseph. Enabling them to bear each trial with joy. And so give glory to his heavenly father. My friends, those of you that are married. God imparts the grace to you through the sacrament of matrimony. To endure all the trials that you're going to meet with in your married life. Do you know that? Do you know what the fruits of the sacrament of marriage are? That's one of them. One of another fruit is the fruit to fidelity, to be faithful to your spouse. It's in there. It's in the sacrament. God gives you everything you need. Everything. He will give you peace of soul if you are faithful to Him. He gives you the graces to overcome the trials and tribulations of your life. So let us in the like manner take Jesus with us on our journeys from place to place. And he will have the same care of us. No matter how hard or repugnant the trial may be to which obedience subjects us. Often that which appears to us to be cruel, imprudent, and even foolish is actually the will of God manifested to us through superior situations that we're in. So once again, God knows what we need. He knows what he, we need to sanctify us. And He's constantly working through our lives with the people around us, with the circumstances that we're in. It's constantly Him. You know, He's the artist. He's shaping you. He's, caught, he's like a wood. He's sculpturing a, a statue out of wood. He's chipping away. And all these things have a reason. And if you have that attitude, like Job did, you're going to be fine. So Mary and Joseph dwelt in Egypt until Herod's death. The Egyptians were plagued in loathsome idolatry, while the country was a cradle of every kind of superstition and a veritable sink of corruption. Oh man, what about us? We put the Egyptians to shame in this country. We don't get it. God keeps on sending natural disasters to this country and throughout the whole world for the sins of mankind. To wake mankind up that we will repent. They don't get it. Just recently, Hurricane Isaac hit somewhere. <laughs> and the day it hit was a day that they were having a homosexual parade. You think they get it? They don't get it. They practice voodoo there too all the time. They don't get it. They keep on getting hit storm after storm after storm. And they keep saying, no, no, Barabbas over Christ. Crucify him. So they go into this country, the Holy Family. God himself enters into this place of corruption, superstition. And he puts us there now. We're surrounded by it. He wants you to be a light to the world. He wants you to bring his presence into this corrupt country, into this corrupt church. Yes, the corrupt Catholic church. I just read an article before on the email. I couldn't believe it. In Germany now, they just have a, a, a canonical law that came out. It's, it's a law now that if you do not pay the church tax, you, you are excommunicated. You cannot go to the sacraments. The only sacrament they allow, they say, is if you're dying. Are you? And the Vatican approved it. 
I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. If you don't pay tax, you can't have the sacraments. What are we coming to? What are we coming to? Barabbas. That's what it is. Barabbas over Christ. Crucifying. Constantly. That's all we get. So once again, as Christ went into this corruption, into this nation filled with idolatry, superstition, He puts us there now to represent Him, to bring Him into a world. If you don't bring Christ into your workplace, my brothers, He may never go there. Are you looking to evangelize? Are you looking to bring Christ? Are you looking to exercise the virtue of charity to help those that are in need? Our actions speak louder than our words. But this is what He wants. And sometimes we could get very negative. Sometimes we could get depressed. Sometimes we can almost feel like, hey, is this, this is so bad. Like you just want to give up. We can't give up. We have to trust in God. We have to fight this. But we have to know that God is with us as long as we're in the state of grace. As long as we're being faithful to the true church. So he goes into this land. But nevertheless, as a return for its hospitality, in harboring the Savior of the world. How wondrous a spectacle did that country present in the early days of the church. Its desert blossomed as a beautiful garden in the sight of heaven, and its school became fruitful in learning and glorious saints. It remains for us to spread the good seed of our prayers and the holy example in the midst of a depraved and perverse generation that when we are gone, the seed thus sown may germinate and produce familiar, similar fruits in generations yet unborn. And this will happen. And God allows trials and tribulations once again to bring a greater good, a greater glory out of it. You want to see people that have the true Catholic faith go to China. Now there's two churches in China. There's the Patriotic Catholic Communist Church of China, which is from hell, which are schismatic. And the Vatican won't even proclaim them schismatic. They believe in abortion. They don't believe, they don't, they're not obedient to the Pope, but they won't be called schismatic. They're schismatics, they're heretics. And the true church, the Catholic church, is underground in China. And every year they burn hundreds of those churches down and they're still martyring our Catholic brothers and sisters in China. But those people have a faith that is rock solid. Those people have still joy in their hearts even though they suffer because they're living Christ. That's where the church is vibrant. And that's what God's going to do to our country now. He's coming now. He's going to gut our church here. He's going to purify it. And He's going to take all the cancer and the poison out. Because when the body's so infected, the only thing you can do is cut it out. That's what's going to happen here. And He needs you. He don't need you, but He chooses to use you to be an instrument, to remain strong. To strengthen your family. You've got to become warriors. Warriors. The church militant. We need real men. Men that are willing to lay down their lives for Christ in this church. That's what's missing today. But believe me, I'm trying to prepare you. And people still are blind. They don't think it's coming. It could be, it could be tonight before this retreat's over. Because when the stuff hits, it's going to hit bad. This country is preparing for martial law. And that's a fact. There's reports all over the country. It's starting little by little already. When the riots start, it's going to be horrible. 
And let me tell you something, there's enough out there because it's happened in other countries. So what happened to the other countries, the same thing's going to happen here. When there's no food. And so on. But God's going to rebuild His church. He's going to purify and sanctify. And He's raising up great saints now. Many of those saints, I believe, are going to be your little children. If you lead them right. If you teach them how to be men and women of God. If you're going to be on your knees every night with them, leading them in the rosary. If you're going to teach your little ones how to do mental prayer. But first you have to learn. I tell people all the time, teach your children mental prayer. If your child is old enough to talk to you, that means he or she can talk to God. And that's what mental prayer is. So you take your child every night, you sit him down and say, I want you to be quiet in your room right here. And I want you to give him a picture of Jesus, talk to Jesus without your lips in your heart. Children are so innocent, they could do that. And it's beautiful. Teach them, lead them. Because this is what God's going to do here. I'm warning you, it's happening. It's going to happen real soon. We may not make it to this election. You know, and it doesn't matter which one of those clowns get in because they're going to scourge us. They're evil. Let us, in our prayers, bewail our want of resignation to the will of God in the comparative light trials which we have had to suffer as well as our imperfect obedience to those appointed over us. And let us beg through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and Jesus that we may for the time to come perfectly conform ourselves to the pattern which he has set. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son.